Yeah, no doubt. This was phenomenal compared to, yeah. I mean, I, I, you, you guys, I should do better too. Everybody was asleep. We were waiting for everybody to show up at the end, you know, because somebody will show up at a at the end of this service, and we'll just turn around and pretend like we started. You guys have never done that? Have you guys ever come to the end when it was you thought it was the beginning? Nope. Really? I have. I was meeting a girlfriend at church in Maryland when I was in school, and I got the church all ready to go, and they were singing, and I thought, ah, oh, first song. And then everybody left, and I'm like, what the heck is going on? But on the flip side, I got plenty of sleep. You know what I'm saying? Because this spring ahead stuff, this is, this, is, this is not good, spring ahead. Yeah, who wants to spring ahead? Let's fall behind. We should just fall behind every season, you know, get so much good sleep. Totally screw us up. We'd be going to work at midnight. How many of you guys have ever heard this? Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the door. Where's the people? Down the street at the bar, open the door, there they are. You know, what's great about The Rock, and I've been talking to people about church, and people don't want to go to church because church boring, you know. And uh, You know, I, I hope and pray that if you, you showed up this morning, first of all, you should probably buy a lottery ticket for showing up at church. You could be blessed. Somebody won a million bucks in Great Falls, right? Yeah. I'm like, oh, I wonder who a church won. Because we're not that good of Christians. People here play the lottery. You know what I'm saying? We're all, yeah, we got a little hope going on. Right, Murphy? Yeah, not you. You're too cheap to play the lottery. You just play poker. Anyways. <laughs> I got my brother. Um. Yeah, I know. Whoosh. Look, there goes the pastor. Whoosh. Brian asked me to uh, um, make sure I, I talked about two things. Uh, first, let's do leader cast. Uh, every year, I and the leadership team, a few of us, we, we, we do a leadership meeting. Uh, we usually go to, I usually head south. Uh, there's a leadership conference that I usually go to down in Lakeland, Florida. Really enjoy it. Um, this year I was looking at it, it's a one day conference, and I'm like, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm going to go. I'm, I, I kind of like, I'm probably not going to go to that conference. Um, it's, it's pretty daggone expensive. It's worth it. You know, it's not that it's not, the value isn't, isn't there, but I thought, you know, what could we do for people in our community? I, I went online, checked out leadership conferences, found out that John Maxwell and uh, the owner of uh, Chick-fil-A down in Atlanta, Georgia, they, they get together and they, they do a leadership conference annual. And they put it together, and they got some phenomenal speakers. I looked at the people speaking, and I go, I would love to hear Rudy Giuliani. I'd love to hear. Um, we can't advertise it on paper, but Peyton Manning. I'd love to hear uh, Malala. Hmm, that's it. Young lady who was, they tried to kill in Iraq. And uh, the CEOs, the, the guy with the Navy seats, love to hear these speakers, and, and I haven't heard them. So I'm like, this would really be good, and it would benefit our community, and it would be benefit people in business. So uh, we decided we would sponsor it, spend some big bucks to do it, and uh, it's 80 bucks a ticket. We, uh, as Brian said, we, uh, we have a sound and lighting guy coming in, and we're going to have uh, three 80-inch flat screens up here to uh, present the uh, conference and uh, we would love for you to you know if you you know somebody in business or if you just want to be encouraged in, in leadership area you know uh, it's going to be worth your investment it's going to be worth your time we're selling 120 tickets that's it uh, no more it's maxed out at 120 you can get tickets online you can uh, it's a five dollar charge if you get them online you can buy them here at the rock to see Brian um, don't see me because I don't have any of the tickets yet, so see Brian, and uh, you can get the tickets here. So it's uh, Friday, May 8th, and you'll dig it. And um, what else was I supposed to say, Brian? Anything else? Was that? I thought there were two things. Oh, just the one? I was just supposed to preach then, next. All right, I'll preach. Did I do? Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the door. Where's the people? 
down the street at the bar. The first time I heard that, I laughed my head off because I never heard that. I go, what? And then I had to memorize it. So I told my Sunday school teachers. They got mad at me. No, they're not. I go, yes, they are. <laughs> Anyways. You know, I'm glad you're here this morning. And look around you. Some of the blue, some, some more of the blue chairs are full. That's pretty good. So I know it's spring break, so Sean had to show up. So thanks for coming, Sean. Pro I know you wanted to go fishing, didn't you? Yes, he's like, oh, man, Pastor, I wanted to go fishing. Listen, you go this afternoon, God will bless you. <laughs> and those, those people that skipped out of church and went fishing, you know what's good? God will bless them, too, because that's God. They're going to miss some good stuff here, you know, that they'll never get back. Never. That's the best I can do on that. So, Deuteronomy. Uh, he repeats himself. Moses repeats himself. He repeats himself. And uh, it's just repetition to give the law. Because what the deal is in the book of Deuteronomy is, uh, it, remember these people are standing at the Jordan River and looking over to the other side, and they're going, we are about to enter into the promised land. And Moses says, yes, you are, because a whole generation of people are dead. The reason they're dead is because they totally disobeyed God. They just did whatever they wanted to do, and God said, you are not going to get to go to the promised land. You are all going to die. Now listen, when we read the Old Testament, when you guys read the Old Testament, how many of you guys read the Old Testament? All right, if, some of you do. That's good. Uh, if you haven't, you should pick it up. Get one. Read it. It comes along with the New Testament. Start with the Old Testament. The Old Testament has revealed itself in the New Testament. I was talking to this kid last night, and he's like, do you find that the Bible contradicts itself? I know. I go, no, I don't. Bill Maher does, but I don't. I go, matter of fact, it's so cohesive, it's ridiculous. And, uh, and when we look at the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, we see that God chose a people called Israel, and he chose this guy named Abraham. And he said, Abraham, through you and all, the, all your family, it's just a huge boatload of kids you're going to have. Just, you know, as much, the stars, the, the sand, just a whole mess of them. And through you, I'm going to introduce the world to me. Because for some reason, I have tried to reach out to humanity, and humanity has not accepted me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach out to them through you. And they're going to see that when people obey me, the rules that I give you, that they will be blessed. And, uh, uh, and they got to give it their best shot. But now here's the deal. He gives them all these rules. And the reality is they, we can't keep them. Humanity cannot keep them. Now, I want you to remember this. When, when you read the Bible, either the New Testament or the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, moved these people to write it down. So it's God breathed. But now, while this was, while people were reading, listen, these people went to work every day just like you do. You know, they, they were growing grapes. They had a vineyard. They were making wine. They were, uh, uh, they were traveling. You know, dusty roads, but they traveled. They had marital problems. They fought. People still, people committed adultery. They had to get counseled. There were judges that sat at the, the gates of the city, and people came to him and said, listen, I think my neighbor stole some of my land. And then they would take these cases before them, and they would make a, they would make a ruling. And God made all this happen because life still goes on. They had kids. They got in fights. They made money. They lost made money. They had bad investments. They had good investments. They went to war. They had battles. They fought over land. And all the time, they're living in tents because they're waiting to get to the promised land. And they got all these rules that they're supposed to obey. Now, God did that for a reason. And we're going to see why he did that. Uh, well, I, I know you guys know, but we're going to see. But meanwhile, God says, I am God, and there's some things you need to do. When I have talked to some people recently, it's really weird. Uh, it, it's, it's not weird. It's a God thing. I've talked to some people about, about God and um, their problem with God. A question that I was asked recently is, is why do you think it is that people don't believe in God. Is it because uh, they think the earth is millions and millions and millions of years old? Um, 
is it the science thing or, or what is it and uh this man that asked me he's 27 years old and i had a 48 year old ask me the same thing this week and i said y you know what i think it is i think it's because somewhere along the line this person was hurt uh wounded by some religious freak religion hurt him not god but they you know they put religion and god together and and that's what hurt him and i go because really god says we believe in him via faith we don't see him we see the results i believe we see the results i you know when i talk to these people who are far from god you know, they have all kinds of questions about this, the Chilton's Manual for Life, the Bible. They have all kinds of questions about, like, is it real? Is it fake? You know, how do you know it's true? I go, well, nobody's ever not proven that it's true. There's more manuscripts on this book than any other book. That's why it's a number one bestseller. And I believe it's God's instructions to you and I on how to enjoy life. And it's a relationship, not a religion, because really, people are really irritated about re religion. And they, it's funny, they ask me, they go, uh, they ask me about church, and I go, listen, I, my hope and my prayer is that when you show up here, you want to show up here. Or somebody paid you to show up here, so you made it worth your while, you know what I'm saying? Good donuts. <laughs> Nobody paid you to show up? I bribed a few. You know, you show up, I'll take you to lunch. McDonald's, but it's lunch, you know what I'm saying? Because it's so much better when the heart is open to hear what God wants them to hear it's so much easier to listen to what god needs to say but i know many people show up on sunday and their their fists are closed they don't want to hear anything but there's this thing called the holy spirit and they didn't have it in the old testament i want you to know the spirit of god he wasn't dancing around he was just put on a few people but the, but people didn't get the spirit of god only a few select well we got what they got was the law. But God really wanted them to, to enjoy life. You guys remember when we read Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22 through the end? And he said, listen, you know, every now and then you're going to take a tenth of your crop, a tenth of your cattle, your goats, your sheep, uh, your grain. And you're going to go to a place and you are going to celebrate. You're going to celebrate knowing me. Now, a lot of people don't celebrate knowing God, but he wants you to. He, you're going to celebrate knowing me. And then he also said, listen, if it's too far to go, if, you can't, if, you can't, if it's too far for you to go, then why don't you go down to the, down to the market and sell some of your cattle, your sheep, your goat, uh, some of your grains, and then get all this money, put it in a pouch, and then, then I want you to go somewhere. And what's always interesting, God says, I want you to go somewhere. It's almost like God says, take a vacation. You know, we think of vacation, oh, no, we can't afford a vacation. God wants you, if you need to, sell something and go on vacation. I, I, I'm into that, amen? People are going, oh, hallelujah. But some of you aren't. Some of you go, I've got to go to work, got to go to work, got to go to work. God goes, no. You need to recreate. To recreate means to recreate who you are, your soul. And you got so many rules and regulations. One of the rules that God made for all of humanity at that time was to go have a party. And he says, when you get there, he said, go buy some wine, go buy some liquor, go buy some steaks, go buy some lamb. It does. It says liquor. I know. She's looking at me like, it doesn't say liquor. Yeah, here, I'll read it for you. So you teetotalers won't be, you know, you can get ticked off at your pastor if you want. It says this. Uh, when you arrive, you may use the money to buy any kind of food you want, cattle, sheep, goats, wine, or other alcohol drinks. Now, God doesn't, didn't want them to be drunks, but I guarantee, I don't know what kind of, I don't know what kind of liquor they made back then. What do you think, Alan? Like, uh, Jameson? Maybe he wasn't around yet. Um, Bean? Jim Bean or something like that? Bob Bean? Bean of liquor? Who knows? But I always find it funny. Christians go, oh, they didn't drink. They didn't drink in the Bible. Oh, my God. <laughs> he told them, go buy some liquor. Can you believe that, Paul? 
Because he, here's the deal. First of all, God is like, I want you to celebrate everything I've done for you. And here's a rule. Take a vacation and enjoy. Oh, weird, huh? That's a God thing. They probably didn't forget that rule. Matter of fact, they probably practiced that maybe a little too much. We don't know. After he gives them those rules, he, uh, if we go to chapter 16, uh, he, he, he gives them the rules of debtors. Every seven years, you've got to wipe all your, all your people that are Israelites. You've got wipe to their, wipe their debt clean. And he goes, and if you don't, you'll get hemorrhoids. So, are you guys with me today? All right. Well, it doesn't say that, but uh, he does say he's going he's gonna to smack them. Okay? And then he tells them, he also tells them this. He also says, listen, at the same time, take all the money, all, your, all these other things that you have. He goes, and bring them to the temple. Bring them to the Levites. And this is what God says. God says, I'm going to take care of the widows, and I'm going to take care of the orphans. I'm going to take care of the foreigners in the land. God is basically taking telling Israel, be generous. He actually tells us in the New Testament, be generous. Look at the person next to you and say, are you generous or are you a cheap person? Yeah, are you generous or are you cheap? Yeah. You're thinking about that. Hmm. Listen, you sh you sh we should all be generous. Generosity, really, it's... It, Every cool TV show that I watch um, is people are generous. There's just, it's the coolest stuff. You know, when people build somebody's house and they don't know it and then they get it and you're just like, oh, that's so cool. I cry. I don't tell anybody I cry except a million people on web now. But it's just so cool. Generosity. And did you know generosity is contagious? Unless you're selfish. And then we, we'll deal with you later. The Passover. He says, don't forget the Passover. You guys remember what the Passover is? It's when the plane passes over. That's the Passover? That's not the Passover. It's when the death angel, when they smeared blood from the lamb, from their pet lamb, and they smeared blood on the posts of their house, and the death angel passed over while they were enslaved in Egypt, and it was the last plague, and the Pharaoh said, Get out of here. He couldn't take it anymore. His first son died. And the plague, that, that was it. The Egyptians said, please leave. So what they did is, and God said, listen, this is what's going to happen. They're going to give you all their gold, their silver, some nice horses, some nice cattle, some nice sheep, some nice goats, and you're going to take it all, and you're going to ride out of town. And that's what they did. They rode out of town just like that. They were on two hump camels, and they were getting out of town. That's what they did. As they got out of town, the Pharaoh said to himself, holy cow, what am I, crazy? There go all my slaves. Who's going to make the bricks? Not me. Not my people. Let's go get them. So Moses and, his, and, and, and all the Israelites, they're, they're out of town. Da -dun, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun. You know, they're gone. And, uh, they, and then they cut them into a, a river, the Red Sea. A sea, not a river. A sea, the Red Sea. I don't know who called it the Red Sea, but that's what's called that. Been called that for quite a while. They, even, they already knew it as the Red Sea. So they come to the Red Sea, and, uh, and what did the people do? They complain. They whine. Oh, why did you bring us here, Moses? And all the women were telling their husbands, I can't believe you followed him. What were you thinking? Well, I thought we'd be safe. And they forgot about the Passover. They forgot about the plagues. And they're in a predicament. And isn't it true, when you find yourself in a predicament, you instantly go, God, what were you thinking? What were you thinking, God? Like it was his fault that you're in debt. You know, God, you ran those credit cards up way too much. I was being generous to myself. So the reality is we are so much like that. And, and, and Moses is like, and Moses is, he's talking to God. Like you'd be talking. He's like, okay, goodness gracious, what am I going to do? 
He goes, God, these people are driving me nuts. He's like, Mo, I know, I made them. They're going to drive you nuttier than you can imagine. Anyways, and, uh, and so here come the Egyptians. They, they put their, the, uh, uh, the Israelites, they put their head on the ground, you know, like we see in the cowboy movies, you know, when they're listening. And they run the most, hey, Moses, they're like uh, two days away. And, you know, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun. they're coming. But they, they don't have many horses because the horses that they left them are slow, so they're really slow. They're like a pinto. And the Israelites had corvettes, and they had a pinto, four cylinders, barely goes. So the Israelites had quite the jump on the uh, Egyptians. But the Egyptians, they're really, they're mad. They're like, I don't want to make a brick. So they want to go get him. And God says, you know, you're going to take this staff and you're going to, you're going to hit the, the sea and, and it's going to open up. And uh, then you're going to cross. And, and we see that that's, that's what happens. What says the Bible? It happens and they cross. And they get to the other side. The last person gets across. And uh, the Egyptians, they're, they're going like uh, the Dickens to get to them. And, uh, and then the sea collapses in on them, and they die. And then the Israelites are like, man, we're bad, we're bad, we're cool. Yeah, Moses is good, we love Moses. Uh, just for a little bit while, and then they start whining again, and Moses is like, kill him! And you guys have been here, you've read all this. Um, and finally, God gets fed up after Mount Sinai, he gets fed up with him, he goes, this generation's going to die, and they die. Meanwhile, he gave him all these rules, all these regulations, and he tells, Moses tells him again to this new generation, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, he says, don't forget the Passover, because it's amazing how fast you forget what I have done for you. And isn't it amazing in your own life how fast you forget the goodness of God when he's been good to you? We forget his kindness, his greatness, his goodness, his forgiveness of our sins, how he takes care of you, and you forget it like that. And it's been going on since God created humanity. We got to be glad we don't live under the law. You have to be glad. Turn to chapter 21 please, Deuteronomy chapter 21. There's all kinds of regulation. You guys can take your time. Some, some good reading. But chapter 21, uh, verse 18. How many of you guys were a rebellious teenager? Some of you guys must be sleeping because everybody was a rebellious teenager. You got that? Oh, I love this one young lady. She, her, her, her daughter is 13 now. And uh, uh, she came to me. She goes, my daughter doesn't listen to me anymore. I go, no. Oh, yeah, you know, she doesn't even want to hang out with me. You're kidding. Really? Oh, I'm shocked. Listen, man, when my girls hit junior high, you know, it was like, Dad, drop me off a block away. Pretend like you don't know me. They called me up, hey, Dad, can you pick me up at school? Yeah, but don't drive that car. I had a Malibu station wagon. They didn't want to be seen in it. No, if you got to drive it, just park right in front of the Ursuline Center. I'll just walk down to you. I'm like, goodness gracious, if you walk to the Ursuline Center, we're only two more blocks away, you know? No, you got to pick me up. But you got to do it like you're cool. Because in junior high, you got to be cool. Right? And, and so everybody's a little rebellious. Don't, don't, you have to be. You want to know why? Because God's making it so you can leave your house. Because your parents don't want you there forever. He even ticks us off when you come back for lengths of time. Like, what are you doing back here, man? Me and your mom, we were having a good time. Here's some money. Go stay in a hotel. Get out of here, will you? Good Lord in heaven. Once you're out, we wanted you out for good. Anyways, I love my kids just in case they're watching somewhere. Come on back, see us uh, for a little while. Anyways, so here's, this is the law. And you, you're going to be glad you're not in our lives. But how many of you guys were really rebellious teenage boys besides Chad? I know Chad. Oh, yeah, there's some good rebellious boys in here. Listen to this. This is what would have happened to you. Deuteronomy chapter 21, starting at verse 18. Suppose a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father or mother, even though they discipline him. 
In such a case, the father and mother must take the son to the elders as they hold court at the, town's, at the town gate. The parents must say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious and refuses to obey. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his town must stone him to death. In this way, you will purge this evil from among you, and all Israel will hear about it and be afraid. Some of you guys would not be here today. They would have taken you to the town, to the elders. They would have taken you off to the parking lot and beat you to death. And then some of you would be here today because you would go, man, I, I'm, not, I'm quitting. I'm not doing that anymore. Did you see what happened to that dude? They stoned him. Aren't you glad we're not under the law? This is good stuff. This is, this is amen stuff. Aren't you glad we're not under the law? Isn't it weird how some Christians want to be under the law? Isn't it weird they go, oh, you know, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't, you can't, you can't. It's like, can I breathe? Can I drink this? Can I go do this? Well, maybe. Did you ask God? Well, I... I thought he said it was okay. Because what happened is the law became so, it, 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 became, it became their God. The, God knew this was going to happen, but he gave them all these rules and regulations to say, you're never going to, you can't keep them all. You just can't do it. And there's nothing worse than people who say they love God and know God and they call themselves Christ followers go, oh, by the way, you know you have to do this, 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 this. And then they tell you that. And then I run into these people later and they go, I go, well, you know, what happened between you and God? Well, I met this person that said I had to be like this, 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 this. And I didn't want to do that. And I go, yeah, absolutely. Nobody had any business doing that. Only God has that business. That's his job. If we lived under the law, absolutely. There would be these Levites. They were the priests. They were the mouthpiece of God. And they could tell you what you should or should not do. They gave you the rules and regulations how to live. And when you lived righteously, it was amazing how you were blessed financially, physically, spiritually, emotionally. You were just blessed. Your family was blessed. Your grandkids were blessed. Everybody was blessed. But it was so daggone hard to keep it. And pretty soon it became a religion, and that religion kept its thumb on people, and people could never seem to get above, to rise above it. God's like, listen, don't sweat it. I got a bigger plan. I'm going to send this thing called the Holy Ghost one day, and he's going to change everything. He's going to change everything. First of all, the, God the Son is going to show up, me, in the flesh. God, I'm going to show up, and I'm going to live, love, die. For all of humanity, there's not going to be any more grain sacrifices. There's not going to be more blood sacrifices. There's not going to be any more of that kind of stuff because I am the Lamb of God. I will be sacrificed for your sins, and I will tell you that I love you. And then what's even cooler, I'm going to send God, the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the joy of God, the happiness of God, the breath of God, the creativity of God that dances across the oceans, across the seas, that we don't, we don't see, but, the, but, but, but we see the movement of the, of the wind and the trees. And we feel the Spirit of God and the God's breath upon our hearts when we're doing something wrong or we're doing something right. When something great happens, we go, and we have this emotional time, and we go, that was God, that is the Spirit of God. The moment he in your life when somebody said to you you need a savior that you're a sinner and you're in need of a savior do you want to spend where do you want to spend eternity and something deep inside your soul said i believe in god i believe in, i can't believe i said that but i believe in god and god the spirit cracks open your chest and he convicts you that you need a savior and for first time in your life, you actually walked down an aisle, you got off your butt, you opened opened up your eyes and opened up your heart to god and you said my goodness I didn't know life could be so good. I need a savior. And in Acts chapter 2, after the resurrection of Christ, because he says in John chapter 16, he says, it's not going to happen until Jesus is gone. He says, when I'm gone, it's going to get better. So that's what's cool. God says, when I'm gone, it's going to get better. I'm going to send the paracletos, the comforter, the, uh, uh, the counselor, God the Spirit. 
And he's going to convict men of sin, judgment, and righteousness. And he's going to breathe into people, humanity, a life. And so, remember in the Old Testament, he says, I want you to celebrate. Why don't you have parties? I want you to get together on certain days and have a party and festival because I want you to remember because you quickly forget. And in one of these times when they were partying, this is what happens in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It says this, on the day of Pentecost, the believers were meeting together. And the believers were the people that said, I believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That was the believers. We believe this. So on the day of Pentecost, which is a celebration of, of the harvest, he said all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty wind sermon, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. I mean, these people weren't going, they didn't do that. They were, sp they were speaking a language. And that guy's going, that guy's speaking my language. This guy from over in this nation goes, he's speaking my language. And they're all proclaiming the good news of God. They're all proclaiming the gospel. And, and they're blown away because they're speaking a language. The word tongues, translate tongues as language. It's, it's, a, it's a spoken language. It isn't something that people didn't understand. They totally understood it. And we can see that that's what the text says. And so when they spoke in the tongues, they spoke in this language. And they proclaimed the goodness and, and the awesomeness of God. But it was blowing people's minds. They couldn't understand it. So listen to this. This is what happens. It says, uh, let's go to verse, uh, 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 verse 14. But then Peter... Peter, the Apostle Peter, stands up. He's going to preach the very first message. He's in church. He's, at, he, he's in the open-air chapel, and he's going to preach the very first message. This was the funniest message you will ever hear, but this is what he says. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. You know, oh my gosh, you know, but here's the deal. Do you guys remember what I read to you in Deuteronomy chapter 14? Right? The tithe to go out, to celebrate the goodness of God, to buy liquor, to buy wine, to enjoy, to, to eat together, to drink together, to share life, to celebrate the goodness of God. That's what they're doing at Pentecost. And it's only 9 in the morning. And everybody that came to for the party, they hear all these different languages. They see this is going on. And they go, what is going on? These people are drunk. Peter, the pastor, gets up and says, it's too early. It's only 9 in the morning, man. We're not drunk. <clears throat> Isn't that amazing? Did they care about the alcohol at all? No. What was the message? The message was that God, the good news that Jesus Christ was alive and well. And that he was the most important thing. And that's what they were proclaiming. They could have cared less about anything else. But isn't it amazing that in the Old Testament, God said, I want you to get together. I would never want you to forget the Passover, the, my covenants, my blessings, I think because one day you're going to get together at Pentecost and you're going to, you're going to buy some steaks, you're going to buy some hamburgers. They, they didn't eat baby back ribs yet though. You know, they're, no bacon yet. It's coming. But they didn't have any baby back ribs yet. But, uh, you know, they probably had steak and chicken, some goat, lamb chops, goat chops. I don't know. And then all of a sudden, God says, he pours out his spirit. He just pours it out. He just dumps it on these believers. And there is evidence that the God, the spirit, that Joel said the spirit of God was going to come. And the spirit of God comes. And they start proclaiming to all of humanity the reality that Jesus Christ is risen. And it's good news. And he has come to give you life. Later on in the book of Acts 2, it says that 
about 5,000 people. It was the first revival. About 5,000 people walked forward and put their trust in Jesus Christ. We have the Old Testament. We have the law. We can't keep it. We don't want to keep it. You know, if you had a, if some of you guys, you'd be dead. They'd have had to kill you. We'd be sacrificing chickens, goats, all that funky stuff. But no, God said, here's the deal. I love you. And God gives you and I his spirit. He gives you and I the Holy Ghost, God the Spirit, which is huge. Which is huge. Now, maybe there's some of you, someone here today that said, man, Ken, I, I never looked at it. I never heard it that way. Maybe someone's saying, yeah, the reason I didn't go to church, I, I just hated organized religion. You know, I, I just felt used and abused and all they wanted was my money and, and, and to keep me down. The word of God, God could care less about your money. He's got all the money he needs. Um, we only give because he wants to give back. He doesn't need your money. He told us, he told Israel in Psalms chapter 50, he said, I don't need that. I don't need your money. I don't need your cattle. I got a cattle all over the place. You think I need, you think I need that? I don't need that. We need to learn how to give. That's what we need to learn how to do because he says you need to learn how to be generous. So, so many people have been hurt, but here's the deal. God the Spirit, I hope, is working on your heart. So much so that you go, okay, I, I need to figure this Jesus out. I, you need to know that he, he's there. He does love you. And it's not a religion. It's a relationship. And the Old Testament shows us the wrath, the law. But the New Testament says, you're going to get up. You're going to go to work. You're going to fight with your wife. You're going to fight with your husband. You're going to raise kids. Some are going to make it. Some are going to be dingbats. But you're going to give it your best shot. You're going to learn how to love each other, to share with each other. And the most important thing that's going to make your life what it needs to be is you are going to have a relationship with me. Because I know everything you don't. I know everything you don't. I'm going to ask Brian to come up and close us in prayer. And if, if, if you go, man, I, I, I just need somebody to pray with me. Uh, maybe I need to uh, cross the line of faith. You've never done it before. Uh, you can come on up afterwards and, and see me. And I would love to have a prayer with you. Uh, right after Brian's done praying, if just a few minutes, you guys whose uh, names were in the bulletin last week that are uh, looking potentially to be on the deacon board, we're going to meet right over here. In, uh, in about 10 minutes. Yeah, right over there in about 10 minutes. So you guys that are over there, you need to get out of there. I know, you know, sometimes you guys never leave on a Sunday morning. It's like, are these people ever going to leave? Which I don't care. It's good to visit. You know what I mean? All right, I'll let you go. Let's stand. Grab the sweaty palm of the person next to you. I love that it's no longer in our control. We try so hard to, to make rules, make control, tell people what they need to do. But really, God, just like Ken said, God desires. He doesn't need a relationship with us. He wants it. The creator of the universe wants it between you and him. And the biggest part is just have faith. And who knows? He might teach you to speak Spanish. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we love you so much. Uh, we've got so much going on here at your ministry, The Rock, Lord, and I pray that this week you just watch over all of it. You watch over all of us. And Lord, that you can help us in any aspect of our life that we're trying to keep that control of. Lord, that you can let the Holy Spirit take control. We can feel your burden instead of our burden. Your burden is so easy to bear. And Lord, I pray that... Uh, the you students, as they're at Mizpah, Lord, you keep them protected and that they may just find Jesus. Uh, if they already know Jesus, Lord, that they just grow closer to him. Lord, that the, the ladies' gift exchange is going on this weekend, that you'll be part of that as well, that many new ladies will come to know at least a ministry that they can feel comfortable at. And Lord, everything else, Wednesday nights and, and small groups or whatever is going on, 
Lord, that you will just be a part of it and we can continue to grow in our knowledge of your grace and love. We leave all of this at the most level clearing field there is, the foot of the cross. We ask it in your son's name. And everybody said, amen.